Okay, well, I'll leave the Zoom window open in case anybody shows up. But hi, I'm back. Yay. So, how was everything? How was everything? Um, it was good. So, I was uh, the first thing that they told us when we arrived for jury duty is how long are you going to be here? Most trials only last one to two days. And there was like this collective sigh of relief from everyone in the room. They were right. So, I was in a trial, it lasted two days, and now I'm back. Yay, and you don't have to do it for two years once you actually go through it, I learned. So I'm off the hook for the next two years, which is lovely. Um, uh, it is not nearly as exciting as it is on TV. Let me tell you that, it's just not. There's a whole lot of waiting around and listening to boring stuff and reading rules and things like that. So just stick to law and order. It's much more interesting than, than their version of it. And also when they read the verdict, they don't like start crying and cheering like everyone was stone-faced, as if they didn't hear. So there's another pro tip for you. Don't react when you hear a verdict in a courtroom. That's, that's the decorum. But that's what I learned while I was away. And you all learned about Logit some more, I heard. So I told him to review because this stuff is hard. This is like th about thinking about things in a very different way, and I understand that. So we'll just keep going over it as long as it takes. Um, you're... Next thing you have to do is formative assessment number two. That is available to you and you should be able to answer all the questions. We'll go over that on Tuesday. Um, after that will be your next homework, but based on how far we get today, I'll decide if it will be due Monday as I had planned of that week or Wednesday. I'm leaning towards Wednesday, so make sure that we have enough time to cover everything. But I have lecture two open and example two A open, if you want to uh, join me. I'm picking up on slide 14 here. So we're talking about link functions in this little section of the slide deck. What's a link function? Or you can tell me what it does. Either way. I'll take gestures, words. Yeah. So it takes something that is bounded and makes it unbounded. More technically, it is a transformation of the conditional mean. So we're not transforming the data. We're taking the prediction that is bounded and we're unbounding it. We're stretching it out into positive and negative infinity. That way, our regular old linear model with slopes that keep going can keep going as long as they want. And when you back translate that, what's that called? When you go back from infinity down to the bounded version, inverse link is what that's called. I call it back translate because that's what's happening. Or unload it, sometimes you'll hear me say. Then the predictions stay within their boundaries. So that's what link functions are for. They're, anytime you have an outcome that has boundaries and you want the predictions to stay within the bounds, you need a link function. Uh, the other part that's new is the idea of a different distribution. So not everything has to be normal or conditionally normal. For binary data, that can't happen. So we have Bernoulli instead. In this, this example for binary, we'll have different distributions as we talk about different kinds of outcomes. Um, what's a logit? You want to do it with me? Hang on, let me get the stick. And the conductor. There's no zoomers here, so I can do this. Ready. The logit is the... Nailed it. Thank you. Ding, ding. Oh, the zoomers missed it. Yes, the logit is the log of the odds of the probability of a one. You got to commit that to memory. It'll make your life easier. Very good. So logits, where is the neutral point in logits where the probability would be 50-50? What number goes with that? What does a probability of 0.5 correspond to in logits? Zero. What does it correspond to in odds? One. One, yeah. So if we take the probability of a one and divide it by the probability of a zero, that's odds. <clears throat> so if it's 0.5 divided by 0.5, that's one. And the log of one is zero. So that's how we get back and forth. But the point is that logits make predictions that stay within the boundaries when back translated into probability. 
Logits aren't the only game in town, though. We also have some other link functions, such as probits. Probits are z-scores. So they correspond to the value on the x-axis for your standard normal distribution that would go with that probability for the area to the left. So probits are not based in odds. That means they don't have odds ratios. Um, if you are in the IRT class, what do we call probits in there? Starts with an O. Ojive, yes. So I want to make these connections across, uh, across classes for you. Probits do the same thing, but on a different scale. So probit is consistent with the idea that there is an underlying continuous variable that created the binary version. And if we assume that underlying continuous variable has a normal distribution that corresponds to a probit link with the residual variance of the unobserved thing of one, if we say, nah, uh the pretend thing that we can't ever know about is logistically distributed instead, that corresponds to the idea of a logit link function and that the variance of the underlying continuous distribution is 3.29. We don't have the underlying distribution. This is just a trick to give this model a scale. And it turns out that if you take your probit model coefficients and multiply them by 1.7, they will be pretty close to the logit versions. And if you back translate a predicted logit into probability and then back translate the same model in a predicted probit <clears throat> into probability, you'll get the same answer to like three decimal places. So they both do the same thing. Probit came first because the normal distribution has been around since like the 1600s. And then some genius figured out that, hey, we can avoid having to do integration if we use logits instead, because you can get the probability of a logit much easier. Do you have that formula memorized yet? We'll do that one too. I don't, I don't, I don't have the conductor stick to this because it doesn't have the same rhythm. But to go from logits to probability, it's e to the logit over one plus e to the logit e to the, meaning exponentiate, the button on your calculator. e to the logit over 1 plus e to the logit, and that formula is in various places throughout the slides. Here's some others. So what if the pretend underlying distribution is not symmetric? What if it's skewed? That gives rise to two alternative scales known as log-log, or complementary log log. And if you put a gun to my head and ask me which is which, I would be dead because I'd need to go look back at the slide to remember. So fortunately, future me knew this and wrote it down. Log log is for outcomes in which one is more frequent and complementary log log is for outcomes in which zero is more frequent. So this would be the idea of skewness essentially. And I have a picture here. I've, this is one I actually made myself. I didn't steal it from Wikipedia or anything. That rarely happens. This one shows logits and probits after you multiply the probit by 1.7. Blue and purple are pretty much the same line here. So we're looking at red and green. The red one follows the logit shape as you go from a probability of 0.5 to 1, but it sort of like peters out, levels off on the other side. And that's because we don't have very many zeros. So it's going to be hard to figure out like what this should be. So it's like, eh, we're just going to not try to predict zero with this model. We're going to focus on the side we have more information. Green does the opposite. It follows the shape of logit and probit up to 0.5, and then it sort of peters out. So these are asymmetric types of link functions. Um, here's the transformation for how you get the link and the inverse link. You don't need to memorize these. Don't worry about that. We're going to do logits. That, that's the most uh, likely one. It also corresponds to something known as a log Weibel distribution or Gumbel, and here's a link to Wikipedia where you can talk about that. And in that case, the variance of that underlying distribution is pi squared over six instead. So these are choices. They all use the same conditional distribution, but they're different transformations of the predicted mean. Uh, you can do model uh, AIC and BIC types of comparisons to decide which of these you like best. I will tell you, I very, very rarely see anything but logit or probit. These other two are not used as often. 
So let's talk about how our process of significance testing and effect size is going to change in the world of generalized models. So this is a little bit of review, but hopefully uh, some new stuff too. So we're still going to be using walled tests to judge the significance of fixed slopes. That's estimate divided by standard error. That ratio is treated usually as a T. We're going to treat it as a Z. And here's a table that summarizes it. It boils down to whether we're using denominator degrees of freedom based on sample size. If we're not, we're assuming infinite sample size, then estimate over standard error is treated as a Z, and that's the distribution we would use to get a p-value, and Z squared is chi-square. So if I have one slope, I can talk about it in Z, or I can square that Z, and then it's in chi-square units. If I'm using denominator degrees of freedom, which we always do in standard regression models with continuous outcomes, then it would be T, and T squared is F for one slope. So I make this point because as you go across software packages and models, sometimes you'll see T, sometimes you'll see Z, sometimes you'll see chi-square, sometimes you'll see F. But they're all related to each other. And in particular, F times the number of slopes that you've tested jointly is chi-square. So you can go back and forth as you need to. Um, I have a note here that wall tests in R for categorical outcomes in the packages I'm using are going to differ from those of SAS or SATA because of the way that they find these standard errors. So I'm going to be using something else to help you judge relative model comparisons that's going to work more consistently across packages. And that is this idea of model likelihood. So log likelihood is the idea of height. We're trying to find the model parameters that make the data collectively as tall as possible. The sum of everyone's individual likelihood values after you take the natural log, that sum is model log likelihood, where bigger is better. This traditionally comes in two flavors. In this class, it only is going to be one, regular flavor maximum likelihood. There's also a version called residual or restricted maximum likelihood that shows up in multi-level modeling pretty much exclusively. Um, so we're not going to see that this semester. So that means we can do any kind of model comparisons with these values we want. And this is where it gets a little bit confusing across software as well. Software packages will either give you log likelihood directly, Stata does, uh, some parts of R do, M plus does, in which bigger is better, so that's an index of height. Other software packages are going to take that log likelihood, multiply it by minus two, and give you that number instead. So minus two log likelihood is smaller is better, it's an index of shortness. You want to be taller or less short? So either way, this is going to be the new way that we test models against each other after we add or remove things. Nested model comparisons. This is the analog to an F test for the change in R square that you would do in a standard regression model. So we take the difference in minus two log likelihood as given directly, or we take the difference in log likelihood and then multiply by minus two. You can get there either way. Note the order, it's fewer minus more. So the model with fewer parameters comes first, and then the log likelihood for the model with more parameters comes second. That is needed to make sure the result is a positive number. If you ever do this, uh, try to make this test and it's negative, it's backwards. And by try to do this, I mean ask the software to do it for you, by the way. I have Excel spreadsheets that I'll give you in case you want to do it by hand, but all of my code, I'm teaching you how to do it with the built-in stuff. The number of things you've added is the next piece that you would need to know. The number of parameters from the model with more minus fewer, so it's backwards, because this also needs to be a positive number. And then we have minus two log likelihood, difference, that's what the triangle means, delta, is treated as a chi-square. So that's why some programs do the work for you of multiplying it by minus two, because they know this is coming. The difference in log likelihoods times minus two follows an approximate chi-square. So that's a new test statistic that we'll use. So we compare that to a chi-square distribution with degrees of freedom equal to the difference in the number of parameters. 
So you can get an exact p-value out of chi-dist as a function in Excel. Uh, we can do it in various ways in R, and we can use Stata LR test. So most programs have something built in for this. And the idea is that if we add predictors to our model, and we want to test if the set of predictors improved it as a whole, and we do this difference in minus 2 log likelihood, we compare the result to a chi-square and a significant. That means we made the model significantly better. We made the data taller. We made the data less short if we add things. If we add something and the test is non-significant, we would say it's not better. Not worse, but not better. I tried, it didn't help. That's the conclusion you draw. So I should probably stick with the simpler model because the things I added did not make it better. If you're approaching it from the opposite perspective, let's say you have a model with 12,000 things in it and you want to try to simplify but you don't want to oversimplify and miss something, then the question should be phrased as, is the difference between model log likelihood significant? If so, you made it worse by taking things away. If it's not significant, it's not worse, meaning you can take them away and you didn't do any harm. The first one is far more common. The second one is more common in other situations. Shout out to the SEM folks. Can you think of an example of when you might do a test to remove and see if it's worse or not worse? There's a lot of overlap in the class. This is what's known as the test of model fit in factor analysis and structural equation models. We're comparing our model to the best possible version and asking, is it worse? Those, that's the logic of that comparison. We also have AIC and BIC, which are transformations of minus two log likelihood. So these are in smaller is better form but they weight by a function of the number of parameters. So BIC in particular weights as a function of number of parameters and sample size, so it really wants the things you add to make it better. So these are converging evidence, essentially, if we add things to a model to see if we made it better, or if we take things away to see if we made it not worse. So we can look at, to, to wrap this up sort of into one summary thing, for each slope we have in a model, we have estimate divided by standard error. We look at the p-value that goes with it. If we want to test a group of slopes, such as for the entire model or for a change in the model of multiple terms, we do it this way instead. There is such a thing as a multivariate walled test. That is what happens in regression with f instead, but that is more inconsistent across software packages I have found, so I'm doing it this way. This is a more general way that will always work. So these are the slightly different ways of assessing significance of model parameters. We also then have a different way of talking about effect size. So in the world of logistic regression or probit regression, which is where we are living this week, effect size is almost exclusively indicated by something called an odds ratio. It is a ratio of odds. So this part right here is the odds, the probability of a 1 divided by 1 minus that probability, or said more simply, the probability of a 0. So if this is my model, and I might want an effect size for beta 1 or for beta 2, let's say that x1 here is a binary variable. We'll start with that. So the odds ratio for beta 1 as an effect size would be the probability that y is 1 if x, the predictor, is 1, divided by the probability that y is 0 if x is 1. Oh, sorry, Zoomers. I forgot to share the screen because I got started before you were here. There we go. I'm on slide 20. Um, so this is the first, the numerator here, the whole big line, is if the predictor is 1, what is the odds of an answer of 1 versus 0? And then the whole denominator is, well, if the predictor is 0 instead, what are the odds of 1 versus 0? So it's two odds stacked on top of each other, right? There's a numerator denominator in the numerator and the numerator denominator in the denominator. So if you do um, health research, like a lot of biomedical types of research, odds ratios are huge because it's usually like, what are the odds of dying or remission as a function of being in the treatment versus the control? So it, it naturally maps onto this. 
it doesn't naturally map on if x is quantitative. So like if x2 is quantitative, then rather than saying, if you're in the treatment group relative to control, it's one unit change. So the odds ratio really, really depends on what a unit is of your variable. So they're not really on the same scale in the sense of being standardized effect sizes. The odds will stay the same though, no matter where you start on your quantitative variable. I don't like odds ratios. I'm just gonna put it out there. I have a big problem with them. The reason is that they're not intuitive in terms of how they express positive slopes versus negative slopes. And I have given up trying to get the language right, so I just wanted to show you a table instead. I've given it up. So odds range from zero to positive infinity, where an odds of one <clears throat> means no relationship. So if I have a slope of one, I find the odds ratio effect size for that by taking that logit slope of one and exponentiating it. So e to the slope is my odds ratio. The software will do this for you. That number works out to be 2.7. And the interpretation would be that the odds of, a pro of an answer of one instead of zero are 2.7 times higher per unit greater. So like if I have this table right here, the slope is one. Let's say that my slope creates a predicted logit of one, two, three, four. I can take that predicted logit and turn it into odds by exponentiating the logit. And so here's the predicted odds. It starts at 2.72, it goes up to 7.39, it goes up to 20, it goes up to 54. And the ratio of these numbers is constant at 2.72. So 50 divided, 54 divided by 20 is 2.72. 20 divided by 7 is 2.72. 7 divided by 2 is 2.72. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and it never will. But the world loves this, so you need to know about it. Here's my special problem with it. Let's say that my slope is negative one. Can we just agree that one and negative one are just as strong as each other? The line goes this way or the line goes that way. But now the odds ratio is 0.37 because all negative slopes and logits are bounded between zero and one, and all positive slopes and logits go from one to positive infinity. And to me, it's very weird to think about these numbers as somehow indicating the same thing. <laughs> but the math works out the same way. So if my slope is negative, and I'm generating predicted logits that are negative, then the odds that are predicted decrease in this form, where they shrink by this much as a ratio. So this is why in your example two, I recoded the predictors so that they would all have positive slopes. Because I feel like odds ratios are more intuitive when they can stretch all the way out as opposed to having to be between zero and one. So in your homework, cough, cough, homework notice. It's not up yet, but I wanted to prepare you. I'm gonna ask for logic slopes and I'm gonna ask for odds ratios. And in the results sections, a lot of the numbers are gonna be odds ratios. So when you look at those numbers and you have to decide if it's significantly positive or significantly negative, none of the odds ratios will ever be negative, okay? A negative slope is an odds between zero and one. A positive slope is an odds between one and positive infinity. So you'll have to keep that in mind. The actual negative only shows up in logits. Okay, so this is back to the table that we had before, just to reiterate these three different scales. So if I phrase the model as predicting logits, predicting the log of the odds of the probability of a one, then my standard linear model looks like this. Beta zero, predicted logit given my x predictors at zero. Beta one, change in the predicted logit for a one unit change in x one. Same thing for x two. So I can compute a predicted outcome in logits given any value of my predictors just like normal. I can take that predicted outcome and unlogit it down to odds by e to the logit. 
And then I can take that odds and take it further down into probability, which is e to the logit over 1 plus e to the logit. So any three scales I can use to express a prediction. Logits and probabilities are by far the most common. People usually skip predicted odds unless they're talking about sports betting, which I heard you also learned about last time. Yes. I'm not going to go into that story, but I hope it was informative. And no, I don't have a gambling problem either. I heard about that. We buy scratch-off tickets for Christmas, and we put them in stockings. It's a family tradition. But I've told you guys before, I believe that lottery is a tax on people who are bad at math otherwise, and I don't play it. Gambling is sort of similar in my book. I'm risk-averse. I do not bet things. Anywho, if I have a slope, beta 1 is the change in logit y for a one-unit change in x. I can take that slope in logits and unlogit it into an odds ratio, e to the logit. But i got to stop there. You can't go one step down and talk about how the slope changes in probability. It doesn't work. A one-unit change in logits is not the same unit change in probability. It depends on where you are. It squishes. Remember the picture? Like there's the stretch of logits, and it's increasingly smaller distances in probability. So you can't talk about the change in probability directly using the slope coefficient. It won't work. So the order of operations, when you're trying to talk about your model, you can talk about slopes in logits or odds ratios. You can talk about predictions in logits, odds, or probabilities. But if you want to talk about probability, then you need to convert the prediction to probability and then talk about it. You can't talk about the slopes in terms of probability. Lisa, I have a question. Hit me. Um, so when you are like explaining your results or your model, is it common for people to maybe say like the um, move the logit outcome or to probability, but then also say but the slope for the unit change in logit or no? Do you have to keep it all in the same? Um, what I do is I interpret the slopes and logits, and then I give the odds ratios in parentheses because I hate them, but other people might you know put the odds in the sentence. But when you show a prediction from the model, the y-axis is usually probability. And a lot of times you won't see the, the logit coefficient language. You'll say the probability of this is higher in people who have higher x. Like they'll just sort of skip it and smush them all together. Because you can look at the logit sign, and if the logit slope is positive, you know that's pushing the probability up. If it's negative, it's pushing it down. But yeah, no one knows what the hell a predicted logit means, but it makes it easy to interpret the slopes. Okay. So yeah, I, I talk about the slopes and logits, but then you show the predictions and probability. All right. Other types of effect size, R square is not a thing anymore. There's 17 million versions of them. So the reason that we had an R square in traditional regression is because we had a separately estimated variance for our outcome. Using the normal distribution, there's separate parameters for mean and variance. In the Bernoulli distribution, there's not a variance, just a mean, a portion of ones. So if we don't know how much variance there was to start with, we can't track how it diminishes as we add stuff to the model. In logits, your residual variance is 3.29. In probits, it's 1. In log log and complementary log log, it's pi squared over 6, which I don't know what that is. And no matter what we do to the model, it's going to stay that way. So we can't use a traditional R-square. This has been a subject of a lot of attempts, though. So here's a web page that has like a whole bunch of versions of it. Uh, the version that Stata prints is known as McFadden's R-square. I'm guessing that's somebody's name. And it's based on log likelihoods. So how tall is your model divided by how tall is the empty model with no predictors and then 1 minus that? That's one way of computing it. And there's a function in Stata called FitStat. There's something similar in R that provides a bunch of these things. There's one that I like a little bit more because it translates into other types of models that I wanted to make a point. Um, this one uses the variance of the predicted outcomes instead. So I think it's a little more intuitive. So if we start with an empty model, do you remember that term? Empty, what's it mean? 
No predictors. Why would we estimate an empty model in this class ever? Two reasons. One is to get log likelihood as a baseline so that we can compare our model to it and see if our model is significant in terms of the group of slopes that's in it. The other is to figure out what the hell the software is doing. If you estimate an empty model, you should be able to take your intercept and logits, translate it into probabilities, and that will match the proportion of ones or the proportion of zeros in your data. And which one it matches is the one it's predicting. So empty models are useful for those purposes, but not for other things. But the prediction of an empty model, everybody gets the intercept, right? There's only one term in it. So there is no variability in y hat in that case. So what if we add a binary predictor? OK, now I've got a logit for the one group and a logit for the zero group. <clears throat> now there's a little bit of variability in the predicted outcomes. And as we add more and more predictors, the variability of this predicted outcome should continue to grow. So this is an index of like how much more variability we've introduced in the predicted outcomes relative to what the error is supposed to be in the original underlying variable scale. That's 3.29, or 1 in probits. So this one you'll see also in uh, multi-level models are based on this. This also generalizes to the idea of interclass correlation in multi-level models. So it's one that I've seen more commonly otherwise. All right, we're going to skip that part for now. How are we doing? It's coming, but I'm going to skip like four slides because we're going to do that next. And I don't have the strength for it. I wanted to add this. This is new this year in this class. So when you write a manuscript, what's the first table that you might put in? What would it have? Yeah, like, like for your method section, descriptives for your sample, right? Means, variances, frequencies. Um, if you're reporting a regression model, what's table two going to be, probably? Same vein as descriptives, but not univariate. Bivariate, right? You'd report maybe a table of correlations to go with your means and variances and stuff. Well, what if you're predicting a bunch of binary variables? There is a problem. The possible correlation that you can get between two binary variables is not one. It's only one if both of them have a mean of 0.5. Very unlikely. It's limited by range restriction, essentially. You have to have variance before you can have covariance. And the closer your mean for either of your binary variables is to one, the closer your variance of it is to zero. And that restricts the amount of association you can show. So here's a formula by which you can anticipate this, and here's a table that illustrates the results of the formula. If I have a variable with a mean of 0.1, so that means 10% ones, 90% zeros, and I try to correlate it with a variable that's skewed but not quite as badly, 20% ones, 80% zeros, even if these are perfectly associated, the maximum Pearson correlation I can get is 0.67. And it gets worse from there. Look at this one. If they're skewed in opposite directions, if the mean of one is 0.1 and the mean of the other is 0.8, the highest the correlation can be is 0.17. That sucks, right? So we can fix it by asking for a different measure of bivariate association besides Pearson correlation. So here's some new vocabulary for that. The first three entries on this slide 30 are synonyms. Synonyms. They are different words that people associated with computational shortcuts back when math was hard because we didn't have computers. So what you know of as a Pearson correlation uses the two variables means, variances, and covariances as they actually are. If one of those, uh, if both of those variables are binary, the term switches its name to phi or phi. You take a vote. What have you heard more commonly? Phi? I don't speak Greek. I don't know. 
fi fi fo fum. I don't know which is the right one. But what I do know is that it don't matter because this is Pearson correlation with the computational shortcut. That's what I do know. Point by serial. What if one variable is binary and one is quantitative? You can take a computational shortcut, but it's still Pearson. Okay. So these are all the same damn thing. From here, they are not. So we have new friends, and I, I learned a new one. Tetrachoric, polychoric, biserial, and polyserial are new words. These are not Pearson correlations. These are based on something else. These are based on the idea of the pretend underlying continuous distribution that gave rise to your binary outcomes or your ordinal outcomes. So tetrachoric is for binary variables. Polychoric is for ordinal variables. Biserial is binary with continuous and polyserial is ordinal with continuous. So these are the versions that I would report instead if you're predicting binary or ordinal outcomes. Here's how they work in a concept. Do you remember back in intro stat when you first learned about correlation? I guarantee someone drew a scatter plot, right? Like it, you have to, or you, just, you get kicked out of stats if you don't do it that way. So you've got your x-axis and your y-axis. And the picture that illustrates a zero correlation, what does that scatter plot look like? A circle, right? Like a perfect circle. Another way of thinking about that is if you divided up, let's say you did a median split on your continuous variable, you'd have as many people in each of the four quadrants, right? Now, what if you had a circle that looks like this? What kind of correlation does this picture illustrate? Don't be scared, you know the right answer. What kind of correlation would this shape illustrate? Positive. Positive, yeah. Like, I'm not trying to trick you, I promise. I don't do that. What if the circle were, til were tilted the other way? Then what kind of correlation is that? Negative. Negative, okay. So we know this as a concept for continuous data. What tetrachoric tries to do is say, okay, here's what I got. I don't know what the pretend underlying continuous distribution is because it's pretend, damn it. But I do know what proportion of my sample is in each of these combinations. So if I have a whole lot of people on the diagonal, right, people who got a zero on one variable got a zero on the other, and people who got a one on one variable got a one on the other, that creates this picture over here, a positive correlation. If the opposite were true, if most of the people were in the off diagonal, that's a negative correlation. That's this way instead. So what tetrachoric does say is, okay, let's say that there's an underlying bivariate normal distribution between these two variables. What correlation would have to be there in order for there to be this many people in each quadrant corresponding to the area under each of these sections where the dividing lines are based on your margins of the proportion of zeros and ones. So it tries to figure out the correlation that would be consistent, that would give rise to this table if the real underlying variables had that relationship. That's tetrachoric. And this picture I stole from the internet, from this website in particular, uh, is, poly is uh, polychoric. It has more, it's more crosshairs, T. <laughs> She's like, I can't see it. It has much more lines dividing it. That's the idea. More chunks, right? This is a five by five table or whatever, and this is a two by two. Same premise though. And I, yeah, I stole this picture from someone else, so see them. So these are better measures of association that are unbounded, and this is what we would do instead in generating descriptive statistics. Um, I'm going to show you in the example here what this looks like in our example data. I'm not going to make you do it in your homework, though, because all the packages don't agree. It depends on how it was programmed. So if I look at, in example 2a, on page 3, as a reminder, we are predicting the probability of applying to graduate school as a binary outcome 
from whether your parents have a graduate degree, whether you went to private university for undergrad, and your undergrad GPA. That's the story. So of these variables, apply to is the outcome. That is binary. Parent degree is what that means to me, is also binary. Private versus public, public versus private actually is the way it's worded, is binary. GPA is continuous. So what the right answer is for which kind of correlation you need differs across these combinations. Wouldn't it be nice if the software would like figure that out for you and just put them all together into one matrix? Wouldn't that be nice? Ta-da! Poor Vladimir did this by hand last summer. Do you remember this? Yeah, sorry, dude. I should have learned this beforehand. But I went looking for it, and I found it. So here's my Pearson correlations to start with as a point of comparison. So there is a positive correlation between the probability, no, not, I mean probability, just whether or not you applied to graduate school and whether your parents have a graduate degree. So people with parents with graduate degrees are more likely to want to go to grad school themselves. That makes sense. When I started undergrad, I didn't even know what graduate school was. I didn't even know that was a thing. I knew you could be a doctor or a lawyer, but I was going to be a psych major. What do I care about that? I learned about 10 minutes into my undergrad psych major that I can't do anything without a graduate degree in psychology. So here I am. Uh, whether you went to private school is uncorrelated of your decision, and your GPA is correlated but not very strongly. So it looks like if I were to summarize this table with a noise, the noise would be wah, wah. None of these relationships is that exciting. I think this data set has like 400 people in it or something, which is why even the small correlations are significant. But it doesn't look like these variables are very well related. And if I use the core function in base r, I get the same answer to many more decimal places without p-values, of course. So let's do something else. I am using a user-defined package in Stata called polychoric. So somebody made this. Uh, you can read about it in the online documentation that goes with the, these materials. If you pull up the help menu, it'll take you to the page where the person and all their work is cited. And so I asked for that. So I asked for polychoric, and what it does is figure out what kind of correlation you have for each. So polychoric is more of a gen it's like the most general term. It doesn't actually refer to the specific, the specific names. So now, apply to has a tetrachoric correlation with the graduate degree of 0.38. That is almost double what it is relative to Pearson. Okay, this shit matters. This one, still basically nothing. This one, a little higher. This is a biserial correlation because apply to is binary, whereas GPA is continuous. And the same is true for GPA with parent degree or private school status. So how do I know what kind these are? Because I know what kind of variables there are. But if you're like, can you just like tell me so I don't have to figure it out? Hey R folks, look at this. One of the few things I've liked about R. <laughs> Very limited. So to use this, I had to find a new package, and I don't remember the package name, but it's in the online materials, and I have found a function called HETCOR, which I think stands for heterogeneous correlation pattern. The only catch to use this is that I had to tell R explicitly to make my binary variables and my ordinal variables factor variables. So it knew that. But then it prints out this matrix where the answers are on one half and what kind it is is in the other. Glorious, isn't it? Like you could just take this and plop it into a manuscript. The only catch is that they're not quite the right words. Because <laughs> you know, you, you can't have everything, right? You can't have everything. So polychoric is used interchangeably with tetrachoric. Tetrachoric is binary with binary. Polychoric is ordinal with ordinal, where binary is a special case of ordinal. Biserial is a special case of 
poly serial for binary and continuous. There. That's one of those sentences I had to close my eyes to get right. So here. Right? Nope. <laughs> nope. And here, here's the answer yes. key. <laughs> Future me knew I wasn't going to get this right on the first try and wrote it down. See, see, that's the reason why I don't get out my pen like Jonathan does. Like, I just don't trust myself to know things. I write it all down so that in the moment, if I, if I totally blank, I can just read whatever I wrote. That's my goal. But yeah, I thought this was very, very useful function. So whoever wrote these things, thank you. So this is what I would report in table two instead. Or better yet, why don't you have table two A and table two B because reviewer two is going to want the Pearson correlations just in case. So you give them both and make everybody happy. All right, there. So we had skipped that part earlier because I hadn't talked about correlation yet. Um, let me remind myself what's left. Oh, we're almost done. Excellent. Can I do two more slides? Okay. So another way that people talk about logistic regression is how, how people are classified. Like they take the probability of a one, cut it up at some point, and then they look at how well you're able to recover the zeros and ones in your data. That's kind of cheating. Because if I have a probability of 0.55 and a probability of 0.99, those are both one if after I round them, but do you think those are equally like believable? I wouldn't think so. And the same thing on the zero side. So if you wanted to generate predicted outcomes from your model, this is what I would do. For binary data, you would draw a random binary value specifying a Bernoulli distribution where the mean of that distribution is the predicted probability of a one. So you would have to use distribution functions in your software to do this. But you tell it, hey, I have a person with a probability of a 0.7. Now turn that into a 0 or a 1. And it's going to draw a random number, and it will change it over to 1 if the random number is bigger than 0.7, and it will change it to a 0 if it's less than 0.7. But because it's a random number, you might end up with something that's like out of bounds. So that's how error is recreated in this in this. Actually, not out of bounds, but like doesn't match. Doesn't match the rounding is what I mean. So this is what I would do instead if you wanted to talk about how well predicted outcomes correlate with the actual ones. All right, so wrapping up the slide deck, and then we'll move on to the example. Comparing general models, so standard regression and ANOVA type stuff, against generalized models. Let me make sure that... My microphone is still working. Zoomers, can you still hear my microphone okay? The last class had issues with it. Let's see. Yes, excellent. Hooray. So if we're fitting a standard regression model, what are we predicting? Why? Like, that wasn't ever a conversation, right? Like, the only question was, well, what's your outcome? Okay, now you're predicting it. The end. Now it's like, what am I predicting? Am I in logits? Am I in odds? Am I in probability? We know, need to know what the link is to be able to go across that. What estimator am I using to do this? Residual maximum likelihood, as it is known, is a more general way to estimate models than ordinary least squares, but they're the same in certain cases. We're using regular flavor maximum likelihood, and this is not a distinction you need to understand for this class, but because it shows up in other classes, I'm mentioning it. And we're not assuming the residuals are normal. We're assuming that they're multinomial, or Bernoulli is a special case of only two categories. How do we do effect size? In standard regression, we have a true R-square. That means we can talk about R-square for the model, change in R-square. We can do transformations of R-squares, like eta squared for partial or semi-partial. We can do all that stuff in generalized so far for categorical outcomes. We have pseudo R-square, which disagree. We have odds ratios, or we can potentially convert test statistics into Ds or Rs. That's much less common. And the big one on the bottom here, which in retrospect, I probably shouldn't have put it at the bottom. Sorry, T. <laughs> can the fixed effects be compared across models? In regression? Sure. Like my slope was 2, I added a new predictor, and now my slope's only 1. 
So that means the new predictor sort of stole part of the story from the first variable. You can't do that anymore in, in these models. The models aren't on the same scale. And the technical descriptions of it, I have links to these papers. I will warn you, they are impenetrable to me. I can't read them. They don't have any words. It's just all like equations and stuff, and they're in matrices, and my, my mind doesn't work that way. So let me tell you about this from my perspective. Can I do that? Can I talk about Coles? Coles? Yes, it's the Coles analogy. So Coles is a department store. It's a national chain in the United States. I'm not sure if it's international, but it should be. And that's where I get all of my clothes, all of my son's clothes. You can buy housewares, shoes, you can buy anything there. And the thing about Kohl's is that the prices are in logits. They're not real. Because if you pay full price at Kohl's, you are doing it wrong. They send out coupons in the mail. If you buy so much, you get $10 to come back and shop the next week. They have other sales throughout the store. So it's, it's very challenging to know what the actual price is because there's all these deals and stuff. So normally what I do would go over to the price checker, right? The, most stores have a price checker where you put the tag in. I call that the inverse link function that goes from logits to money in this context. And you can figure out what the actual price would be after all the discounts are applied. Now let's say that you're the manager of Kohl's and you know this is how your store works, right? And let's say you have a really high quality garment for Kohl's standards where you absolutely need to make $25 on it or you're gonna lose money. So what do you do? You price it at $50 and you say, it's half off. And people are like, 50% off, I'm gonna get three of them. So people buy the good colors and then there's nothing left but like brown and oatmeal and you know, colors like that. Or, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I do know what I'm talking about. <laughs> there's like, you know, baby girl pink and brown and oatmeal left on the shelf, right? And you got to get rid of these clothes, right? The next season's coming in. So it's like, well, do I make it lower price? Do I settle for maybe $20 instead or $15? No, I got, I got to make money. No, that sure is $100 and now it's 75% off. That's what you do. You keep raising the regular price so that it looks like a better deal in hopes that people will buy the remaining clothes. That is what is happening in these models. If I fit the world's best logistic regression model, what is the variance of my residuals according to the logistic distribution that underlies my binary outcome? It's that pi squared over 3 number, 3.29. That's another number that's going to show up. If I fit the worst model, the empty model, what's my residual variance of the underlying distribution? 3.29. So because that variance can't go down, the rest of the model's like, okay, what would the total variance have to have been in order for the slopes to have reduced it to 3.29. The model is phrased in regular price. And because the sale price can't get any lower, the residual variance can't get any lower, the whole model scale has to keep growing. So as you explain more variance, your slopes get bigger because they're predicting the original price, which had to have been bigger, to still have this much left over. That's my version of it. So the take home message is that your slopes will change as you add predictors, but you can't make anything of that. They're on a different scale. They're predicting a different original price. There, is, there are other papers that have followed and tried to explain this in the same way, but that's, that's the take home. And it gets even worse when you're predicting a multi-level binary outcome. So, but that's not this class, that's the other class. So we'll see that in the example. Should we go back to that? Maybe? Questions or things you want to talk about first? We're diving back into models and code and stuff like that. Oh, I do have a question. Hit me. OK, so when you have data that results in different types of correlation, mm -hmm. how do you recommend we communicate that to readers in like an article? Well. You have two choices. You could do what this person said, and it's like, eh, there's only two kinds. Let's simplify. Or you could tell them this mapping. Okay, so more like maybe a footnote. 
and then like report that table. Yeah, or you could. You would have to decipher the three point seven five is a. Yeah, so if you did this upper lower diagonal thing like this, I've never seen that in a manuscript to be honest, but I think it's a great idea. Oh. You just, you just, here you go. Thank you. Like, I don't think that's what you think. Yeah, so <laughs> like that one yes. is that one. Yep. Yeah, it takes me a minute to do this, but that one is, quit it word, is that one. This, I know this one is this one, and then the others I got to like do the thing, but this is how they tell you. Um, otherwise, you could have like like a plus sign and then a star and then a carrot or whatever and then a legend that says what each is something like that. I don't like that as much. That's too much work. Don't make don't don't make your readers work that hard. That's my general philosophy. So yeah, we have some associations in the data, but the picture in terms of how strong they are changes if you use a Pearson correlation versus these other kinds. That's my take home. And even across Stata and R, they don't match. Like this one would round to 0.38 in this case, but not all of them would necessarily round to the same number. So that's why we're not, we're not doing that in the homework system. But you have code to do this. You can. All right, so should we start an empty model again? Or we feel good with empty model? I, so I heard both. How about not re-go over, but just review? So, two reasons why I'm doing an empty model. Number one, to get the log likelihood value so that I can, I can compare it against other things. Number two, to figure out if my model's predicting the probability of a one or a zero. So what I get back out of this is a single parameter, the fixed intercept in logits. That's the mean. A negative logit intercept here corresponds to more likely to have a zero. That's what I know. A positive logit corresponds to more likely to have a one. I can back translate this predicted logit into probability. Here's the formula. E to the logit over one plus E to the logit right here. It's 0.45. Margins does that conversion for me. In R, I'm using GLM with this extra piece to tell it what flavor of generalized model I want, logits and binomial, which binary is a special case with one trial. And I couldn't figure out how to get R to give it to me, so I just did the math myself. There's probably another way, but this worked. Either way, this corresponds to a predicted probability of 0.45, which I know from my descriptive statistics is the proportion of cases that had a 1. So now I know my software is predicting the one. Then we had three predictors as main effects. To what extent do GPA, parent graduate degree, and public versus private university each unique, uniquely predict the logit of the probability of a one? Now we have a few new things we can look at that I skipped over last time. First up, in Stata, I get this thing. This is where F used to be. LR chi 2. That's my likelihood ratio test. That is the difference in minus 2 log likelihood relative to the empty model. Stata does it for you. So this 20 value is a test statistic. Test statistic. That's a hard one. It's treated as a chi-square. So for three, and where does three come from? Any guesses? Number of predictors relative to the empty model. I added these three things. Is it taller? Yeah. It's taller by this much. And that corresponds to a p-value of one in the fourth decimal place. So yeah, I made my model better. Hooray. Now, does each of my predictors contribute? I don't know that yet. This is an omnibus test. Like overall, does my model significantly predict this outcome? Yes, great. How much? It gives me one pseudo R square, one variant, 4% of the variance by this calculation. I'm not gonna worry about that too much. Stata gives you log likelihood. 
that means to be able to do minus two log likelihood, you have to do the math yourself, and I figured out how to do that. So this little piece of code right here, in Stata, when you type the word display, it becomes a calculator. So I put in quotes, minus two log likelihood equals, because I want that displayed, and then this function accesses what the log likelihood was in the previous model internally and multiplies it by minus two. I wrote that part. So then you don't have to do the math yourself. You can just ask for it, and it will spit out minus two log likelihood. This is going to be the first thing that every model in your homework is going to ask for from now on, minus two log likelihood. It is a thumbprint for your model. If you get this right, your model is right. If you get it wrong, your model's wrong, don't go forward. I will also ask for the intercept from every model. Do you remember why that is? That applied on the golf homework. It applies here too. If your fixed intercept is right, what does that tell you? Additionally, not just the right model, but TAs, you want to help? Yes. So if you get your fixed intercept right, not only do you have the right model, but all of your predictors are centered or recoded correctly, per the instructions. The specific centering constants that I choose are choices. But in order to get the right results, you have to have the model phrased the same way. So then we go through the slopes. Anyone feeling brave? Here, I'm going to zoom it way the hell in so everyone can see this and you don't have an excuse for not feeling brave. Okay, it can't zoom any further, apparently. This is it. The slope for GPA is 0.54. Is that in logits, odds, or probability? Logits. The slope for this one. Also logits. All of this is logits, okay? This entire table is internally consistent. They're all talking about logits. So what happens to the logit as GPA increases by one point? The logit goes up by 0.45. The logit is the log of the odds of the probability of a one, otherwise known as log odds. You will see that as a synonym. What happens to people whose parents have a graduate degree? The coefficient is 1.06. The outcome is the probability, of, or not the probability, a binary variable as to whether they want to go to grad school. If at least one parent has a graduate degree, are they more likely to want to go or less likely? More. So the logit is, <clears throat> predicted logit is higher by one. And you can just look at the sign to answer more or less. If they went to a private university, are they more likely to, or less likely? More, yeah. That one's not significant, though. I'm asking for AIC and BIC because these are things you would use to compare across models, potentially. They are converging evidence along with the likelihood ratio test that what you've done is helped. They have no meaning whatsoever in absolute sense. So like this number being 537 doesn't mean anything. It only has meaning relative to what it would be in a different model for the same data. Here is the output for a user-defined function called fitstat that I downloaded. And here's the 17 versions of R square that provides. Nope, keep going. Here is me making a point pedagogically. So I use margins to ask for predicted values of GPA of 2, 3, or 4. So these are predicted logits. And I know that because I used the option predict XB. The difference between these numbers corresponds to a one unit increase in my X predictor. And the difference is exactly the same. It's 0.54. That's the slope. So 
the change in log at y corresponds to a one unit change in x for the slope. But if I take these same predictions in logits and I unlogit them, I back translate, inverse link them down to regular probability, the differences between these are not constant anymore. This difference is 0.12, this difference is 0.13, and it will continue to grow until I hit a probability of 0.5, and then they'll start squishing again. So this is why you cannot talk about a slope in terms of what it does to probability directly. You can't use the one unit change language in probability, it doesn't work. You can only use that language for logits. But you can say something like, the probability of a one is higher when GPA is higher. You can say something like that, that's fine. If you want odds ratios, cough, cough, next set of homework questions. <laughs> O-R, that does not mean or. It stands for odds ratio. So then the same output shows up with the heading odds ratio instead. So this is e to the logit slope. It's doing the exponentiation for you. Uh, this is a question I get a lot. The p-values here, let's memorize these real quick. 04, 00, 51, 06. If I go back to the original output, 04, 00, 51, 06. Coincidence or consequence? Consequence. The p-values match exactly. They're just repeating it on a different scale. So that means in your homework, you can look at either table to assess the significance of a slope. It will tell you the same thing. It's just a transformation of the predicted outcome. There. Unzoom. R, folks. Here's how you do your thing. GLM is the function I'm using this time. It'll be different for every single model. Here's my formula. I put the one in to remind myself that the first term is, is the intercept whenever you're asking for linear combinations. That's me helping myself. These coefficients are in logits. They're the same as before. R doesn't do the likelihood ratio test for the model. I gotta do that myself. Here are confidence intervals for those slopes if you want those. Stata spits, spits those out by default. Here's how we do a model comparison against any model, the empty model in this case. The command is ANOVA, which has nothing to do with ANOVA, and it wants the saved output from your empty model, which you have to fit yourself as the one with fewer parameters, the output from the current model, and then tell it which kind of test you want because there's different choices. So fewer and then more. And then it spits out this little piece of output that says, hey, here was the log likelihood from the empty model. Here's what it is now. And then here's the difference. So that's my test statistic for the model. And again, why is this three? Three of selectors, yes. Here's a whole bunch of pseudo R squares, not even all of them. There are two ways that I found to get the odds ratios in R for logistic regression models like this. Um, I found a package that had a function that did it, odds ratio, so that worked. Last time I added this and I heard from some folks that it did not work on their computer and we couldn't figure out why. So do this one if it breaks. This is manually trying to exponentiate the coefficients themselves. So this takes the output and does it more by brute force. So in this output, the first column is the odds ratio. These are confidence intervals. And then here's the same p-value that you would get from before. So that's how you can get odds ratios. And then to get predicted outcomes, there are multiple ways to do it. The easiest is probably this prediction function where you put in the range of the predictors that you want the predicted outcomes over, and you can hold other things constant. So if you do this with type equals link, that's in logits. If you do it with type equals response, guess what that's in? Probability, nailed it. And always feel free to read from the screen. 
The answer is usually in a comment somewhere nearby or a text box off to the side. So making the same point, the difference in logits is constant as a function of the predictor, the difference in probabilities is not. There. Ta-da. So your homework, which is not yet available, but will be very soon, will give you the chance to practice all of this. I'll ask for logit slopes. I'll ask for odds ratios. I'll ask for predicted outcomes in terms of probability, all the stuff that you would normally need to be able to do to do an analysis. That's the goal. All right, I don't think we have the energy for interactions yet. Am I right? Am I right? Yeah, I'm right. It's 310, so that's fine. We'll look at that next time, but guess what? Do you know what interactions terms do in logistic regression? Yes, the same thing they do in any regression. They make the main effect slopes less positive, more positive, less negative, or more, I don't even know what that is. More positive, less positive, more negative, less negative. I got to say it in that order, I'm going to mess it up. So yeah, the only catch, we're going to do this again with interactions. The only catch is that they're predicting logits. But you'll get a chance to practice interaction terms again in the next homework as well. So if the golf didn't go well, you get another try. And we will keep doing it throughout the semester until you're really, really good at it and tired of it. That's my goal. All right. Any questions as we wrap up for the week, not just the day? Okay. Then let me know if you need anything. You can do all of your next formative assessment by Monday night, please, and we'll go over it on Tuesday. All right, well, enjoy the basketball game. Have good weekends. Let me know if you need anything. Thanks for coming. Bye for now. <laughs>